Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. We didn't color coordinate, but we both do live in New York, so <laughs> maybe it's just inevitable. It's my uniform right now to you know, <laughs> camouflage a little yes, bit. Yes, you're expecting your third child, a, yes. a boy, a boy in February. Yes. It's exciting. <laughs> we'll talk about how you plan to juggle all that in a little <laughs> bit. But um, yesterday when we were on stage, um, I was on stage with Sarah Hofstetter of 360i, and we were talking about how she started the social media practice at her agency in 2005, and people really thought she was crazy. And it reminded me of your story, because early after you founded your company, you started engaging with influence, they weren't called that at the time, but you started engaging with bloggers on social media and your retail partners at the time, you know, before you had your own retail, the retail was your big channel and they said to you, why are you doing that? Why are you bothering with these people? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, when, when technology began such that I could talk directly to my consumer, it was sort of an aha moment for my brother and I to say, oh wow, we don't need these in-betweens. We can talk directly to her, get a temperature, see what she likes and what she doesn't like. And that scared a lot of people. They thought we were dirtying the brand, that I should be in an ivory tower better than the consumer. Um, and then working with dirty bloggers uh, who were D and C list celebrities was going to take my brand down even further. And my, my brother and I really said we might be the only ones and we might be crazy, but there's something to this. And we're, we're feeling a shift that people are tired of the old way of the one editor who deems you all powerful or the one buyer who determines your fate. And we said we want to own our destiny and if that means that talking to our consumers is a bad or a dirty thing or using these influencers is bad or dirty, so be it. Um, and it turned out we were not wrong. So it's really been something that we've organically pursued since the beginning, not, not to be part of any movement, but just because it felt right to us. And of course now, you know, obviously everybody does that now. <laughs> but that really set the stage for you and your brother, who, by the way, Rebecca and her brother run the company together, um, Yuri Minkoff. And, um, that set the stage for you to really, you ended up becoming quite a pioneer in the use of technology in fashion. Um, you were the first to live stream your runway show. You made use of drones in it. Um, you have this connected dressing room that, in, in, that includes all kinds of smart mirrors and things like that. Um, and you also incorporate technology into your products, into wearables and, and things like that. So can you just quickly tell us kind of how that effort is going? What's the most important of those pieces to you for where you're going next? Yeah, I think the key is is that my brother did have a software background, so I guess we little we have a little bit of a, our cheat in that he's kind of tuned into that m mentality. Um, but what it really is about is using technology to either ease your pain points or get more in touch with you. It's not to have technology for tech's sake or for a tech story or to be written up, you know, in the latest uh, tech blog. But really about what are the things that we as women. Uh, going through that technology could help with. So it's small things. It's adjustable lighting in our dressing room. It's being able to touch the screen and have someone bring you your size so that you don't have to get dressed or you know, creep out half naked and, and hope the associate sees you. Uh, so it's really like, and, and then with our wearables, it's we run out of charge all the time no matter you know, where you are. So how do you have something that's on your wrist that allows you to have charge? or we just launched charging luggage. So our millennial customer is experience-based. Travel is important to her. We all know we need travel uh, charge at the airport. Um, so how do we give that to her in an affordable, accessible price point? So you're doing all these advanced things in your stores and really making it an experience, like you said. Um, some retailers are doing that, but not all. And retail, conventional retail, the big department stores, are going through a really tough time right now. Yeah. Um, a very tough time, but yet it's still a, an important channel for you. But is it increasingly um, a detriment to have your consumer maybe experience you first in a retailer where you're not controlling the environment and not offering those things? I think we look at our wholesale relationships as advertisements of the brand and the product that the consumer who still goes to those venues can touch and feel. And I think when you get beyond you know, California and New York, for a lot of people, going to a retailer is still something they do. And it gets very expensive to just reach those people digitally. Like you see a lot of direct-to-consumer brands, they got the coast covered, and when they get to the middle, it's like, oh my gosh, the amount of money we have to spend to acquire a customer is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. So for us, that cost of customer acquisition by still partnering with the best retailers is a lot less. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully when they go to our stores, which are not everywhere, they're you know, LA, Chicago, and New York, 
they can have the experience we want them to have and, and feel the brand and live it. And we want to make our stores about an experience. So yes, you're going to come shop, but you might also come to one of my fireside chats where I interview um, and, and a female entrepreneur, or maybe you want to come you know, to an event and learn about something else other than shopping. So our stores are really geared towards experience. So what advice would you give to the CEO of some of these retail chains that are chains, department stores, big retail companies um, that are going through so much um, turmoil right now? I would say to make your stores as much as possible about different experiences that women want. Mm -hmm. You know, some stores you've seen um, have experimented with everything from meditation and yoga and they're adding juice bars and I think those are small steps, at least they're trying. But I think the more you can get into the psychographic of the woman and what does she want um, and give her those experiences that you, you're not pressuring her to shop at all. She's coming there maybe just to have that experience and talk to another human. Um, and so if you can give her that or, or do these small pop-up shops, Brit & Co did this pop-up shop slash conference. So you could shop, you could listen to women talk, you could watch movies at night and have drinks with your girlfriends. So I think if retail could sort of evolve to be a multi-channel experience that they'd have better luck, I guess. So you pay so much attention to the millennial consumer, um, the millennial customer. One of the big trends with millennials now is that, as you have said, they, they value experiences over things. And you see that in a pretty large way with that demographic. I would argue with everybody. But um, they're not buying things. So does that, that has to have some impact on your bottom line in some way, does it? It does, but we've, we've made it easy that if she wants to buy something and pay it off in installments, she can. You know, what was fascinating is when we dive into the numbers, she still is purchasing. It's just how she purchases and where she purchases and when that is different. Um, we've made our prices such that, you know, she can still go on the trip and buy the bag. So I think for us, it's also really being smart about how we approach her um, and that she can still do, do it all uh, without having to sacrifice not going on the trip. Mm -hmm. Who has a question for Rebecca? I certainly have more, but um, I'd love to throw it out if anybody has anything they want to ask her. OK, here's one right here in the front row. And please um, state your name and your company when you get the mic. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle. I'm from a company called Cloudflare. What do you think about Amazon? Do you like Jeff Bezos and Amazon, or, 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 or do you fear him? That was going to be one of my questions. Great. Sorry. <laughs> so what's happening with Amazon just makes us go, our brand has to be so strong that a woman is, ne and I think this about women in general, a woman is never going to say, hey, Alexa, I want a white shirt. We just don't shop that way, <laughs> right? I want the Rebecca Minkoff white shirt. So brand and storytelling and content has to be the most important thing um, so that when someone maybe orders a shirt that way or, or something like that, they say the brand. And I think that that's the way we'll sort of beat that system and beat that shopping behavior. Um, currently, we don't sell on Amazon. Um, our, our phone cases are there, but that's about it. Um, but we want to stay in best of breed retailers that give the experience to the consumer as close as we would give it ourselves. So until that day happens, and I'm sure it will, um, we're fine to not be a part of that game. Do you spend a lot of time thinking about Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we talk about it. I mean, we see what they're doing, and they're going to take over the world and all, you know, all that stuff. But I think uh, men might shop that way. And so I just have to hope that my, all you out there will never just say, I want a black shoe, size 9. <laughs> I really hope that doesn't happen. If we get there, <laughs> I'll be sad. <laughs> Who else has a question? Oh, over here. OK, thank you for saying that, because I'm, I wasn't looking over that way enough. Hi, Gazal, Cisco App Dynamics. Um, so Rebecca, is there a time that you look back at in your career that was game changing for you, but also really, really difficult? What was that time, and what did you learn from it? Great question. Yeah, so in 2008, when we saw the beginnings of the recession hit, we actually went out to dinner with one of our department stores to celebrate the year and the business we'd done. And they said, newsflash, if your bag has a five in front of it, our, our, our opening price point used to be 595. Uh, they said, we will no longer carry the line. And we were like, cool, OK. <laughs> And they said, don't change the quality, don't change the leather, take nothing out of the bag, but it needs to be 395. 
Um, and, you know, we kind of had long late nights. It's when I grew my first gray hair. Uh, but really, like, how do you do this? How do you still give the customer the value that she was accustomed to with us and uh, make any money? And so we said, you know, we won't make any money. We will just give the customer what she wants. She's going through a tough time. You know, the, the, the industry is crumbling around us. Let's just do the Wrigley's model and, and hope that one day there's a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So we had to re-engineer our supply chain, when we order, how we order. Um, and then we lowered our prices from $5.95 to, in some cases, $2.95. And when the new merchandise hit, we're like, okay, it's supposed to be like a groundswell of success. Nothing happened. It actually took our consumer about three to four months to realize what happened. Um, so that was a terrible time because you, 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 you plan a budget, you plan everything around this new thing, and then you're like, oh no, now we can't pay our bills. Um, but when it hit, she realized it You know, six months later, and we grew 548% because of that. So during the recession, we grew, and I think it's because she said, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for hearing that like my pocketbook has uh, a lot less in it and, and you've made your product so that I can still afford it. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. If anybody has a question. I have something I'll ask. So um, we can just end by talking about, and I, I just want to preface this, I do ask male CEOs this as well. I really do. You have a child who's three and six. Um, you're gonna, you'll, so you'll have, you have zero, three, and six right now. Um, <laughs> your baby's due in February. How, how do you structure your day, your weeks, your months to prioritize everything you need to prioritize in your life? So um, the balance question, obviously, I think you've probably all been asked that or thought that. Um, I say it was made up by a man to make women feel bad. Um, but I think uh, a woman who I admire a lot, a female designer, said it's called a beautiful hustle. Um, and it's really about juggling. And it's about each person finding what their comfort zone is. So from the minute I had my son, I said, I want to be the one that raises him. Um, rather than never seeing him and working, you know, 100 hours a week. And so what does that look like for me? So playing with how far out of town I go, how long, when I leave the office, when I come home, and going, okay, for me this works. For me, five days is my max that I'll leave my kids, if not one of them comes with me, even though that makes life a lot harder. Um, or when they're little and I'm breastfeeding them for as long as I can, you know, they're schlepping with me to China and Korea and, and all over. Um, and then with work hours too. So what's my max? Where's my threshold of like, this is too much? Um, and I'm lucky that uh, I have a great team that I've learned to depend on so I can walk my kid to school, which to me is a luxury. Um, and then on the nights that I don't have to work late, you know what, I'm leaving at six because I want to get there to have dinner with my kids. I go back to work when they're asleep, but I think it's finding your own sort of sense about it. And you know, I was talking a couple weeks ago, some things suffer. I said, I have a great marriage. I don't see my husband ever. And they're like, well, clearly you do. <laughs> I was like, just there. I just saw him there. That was about it. <laughs> um, but you know, he and I have both signed up for, we're building our careers. We're high-fiving each other through parenthood. But we might not talk a lot. So I think some things suffer, but you sort of look at the, the long term of, you know, our kids see us as present parents. Uh, and they can hopefully look up to us as examples of people that have worked hard as well. Mm -hmm. We just did a panel before this on saying no. Do you have any tips on saying no? You must get so many requests for your time. Yes, I've learned how to, how to politely say no sometimes, mm -hmm. but oftentimes I say yes. Mm. Uh, or, or I'll say yes to a point with some boundaries. Like, yes, I can mentor you, but I really only have 30 minutes, and can we do a call so mm -hmm. I can save on travel time? Yeah. Or, you know, could I have one of my incredible female employees talk to you instead? You know, they're very qualified, and they probably know more than me in this specific area. Well, Rebecca, we are very appreciative of your time here thank today. You. So thank you so much. Thank and you. Good luck.